Let us open our Bibles back up to Deuteronomy chapter 9. We began this chapter last week. We're going to conclude it beginning with verse 7. Remember this, and never forget how you aroused the anger of Yahweh your God in the wilderness. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. At Horeb, you aroused Yahweh's wrath so that he was angry enough to destroy you. When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that Yahweh had made with you, I stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I ate no bread and drank no water. And Yahweh gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commands that Yahweh proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire, on the day of the assembly. At the end of the forty days and forty nights, Yahweh gave me the two stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Then Yahweh told me, Go down from here at once, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have turned away quickly from what I commanded them, and have made an idol for themselves. And Yahweh said to me, I have seen these people, and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. Let me alone so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire, and the two stone tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against Yahweh your God, you had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way of Yahweh that he had commanded you. So I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. Then once again I fell prostrate before Yahweh for forty days and forty nights. I ate no bread and drank no water, because, all, because of all the sin you had committed, doing what was evil in Yahweh's sight, and so arousing his anger. I feared the anger and wrath of Yahweh, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again, Yahweh listened to me. And Yahweh was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. But at that time I prayed for Aaron too. Also I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf you had made, and burned it in the fire. Then I crushed it and ground it to powder, as fine as dust, and threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. You also made Yahweh angry at Taberah, at Massah, and at Kibberoth, Hevanah, Hatavah. And when Yahweh sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, he said, Go up and take possession of the land I have given you. But you rebelled against the command of Yahweh your God. You did not trust him or obey him. You have been rebellious against Yahweh ever since I have known you. I lay prostrate before Yahweh those forty days and forty nights because Yahweh had said he would destroy you. I prayed to Yahweh and said, Sovereign God, do not destroy your people, your own inheritance that you redeemed by your great power brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abram, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Overlook the stubbornness of this people, their wickedness and their sin. Otherwise, the country from which you brought us out will say, because Yahweh was not able to take them into the land he had promised them, and because he hated them, he brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. But they are your people, your inheritance that you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you once again with your word fresh upon our tongue and in our hearts and in our minds that we may uh, grow closer to you through your word, through the understanding of you and, and of your purpose for us, your plan, that we would know your love, that we would feel your presence here, and that we would just open our hearts to know the way we ought to act, the way we ought to treat one another, and how we best serve you on this sinful world. Lord, we thank you for each blessing that you place within our lives and for the very blessing of our life itself. We thank you for the life that we have through your son, Jesus. Through his name we pray. Amen. So we started this out with, remember this and never forget that you provoked Yahweh your God to anger in the desert. And to start with this is appropriate as God is reminding the people through Moses just how stiff-necked they have been. 
And at this point, all of the previous generation had passed away, all but Moses. They were the generation that God wanted to wipe away completely for their rebelliousness. And as they never got to enter the promised land, it looks like his judgment was carried out after all, albeit delayed as it was. Now this generation that now stood on the verge of the promised land was likely unborn at the time. But they had surely heard often about the stubbornness of their parents and grandparents, their aunts and uncles. The unborn at Sinai are now the hope of all Israel. Yet they have shown signs of rebellious, or rebelliousness against God as well. So Moses reminds them of the covenant or promise that God had made with them. He wants them to recognize all the ways in which God had cared for them. No matter what they have done, God continued to be faithful to them. Now their forefathers were at the foot of the mountain, witnessing the awesome displays of God's power. It was in the shadow of God's presence that they turned away from him. When Moses came down from the mountain and he saw their betrayal, he threw down the tablets God had given to him. Now Moses was a representative to God for the people and to the people for God. He was kind of the middleman in, in, in a sense. And so carrying the tablets down the mountain to the people, he was God's representative. And acting as the people's representative, he broke those same tablets. Now Moses did not shatter the tablets out of anger, though. His actions were a graphic display of what he had witnessed the people doing. They, what they had done to the covenant with Yahweh. They had broken their promise to God. And God's righteous anger was now against them. He wanted to destroy them all. It says that Moses intervened on their behalf. It says he intervened on the behalf of the people and on the behalf of Aaron. And it says that Yahweh listened to him. Now everyone thinks that means God spared them because he didn't destroy them in that moment. And despite the fact that they would continue on to be rebellious all of their life. Yes, God listened to Moses, but as none of them would survive to step foot in the lands God promised to them, it doesn't seem that, that, that God had spared them after all. They were a wicked people. Perhaps Moses knew this as he pled for them. He pleaded, uh, his plea was one of faith. If not for that generation, then in the generations to come. He had faith that there would be some among God's chosen people who would be faithful to God. And even in light of verses 22 through 24, he believes, he hopes. See, those three verses read like a very frustrated man who could go on indefinitely describing their sinful ways. But still, he petitioned for them. Moses was a smart man, though. He was raised in the, in, in the Pharaoh's uh, courts. He, he understood a lot about the world and the ways in which, in which everyone lived. He was a smart man. So I'm sure that he saw as the years were rolling on and everyone who rebelled at Sinai, they, they all slowly died off. He was seeing God's sentence over them carried out. He understood that even though he pleaded for them and he, he tried to save them, he seen that they were getting what they had deserved because they were a rebellious people. They were a people that did not come to God, did not trust or obey him. And here he addresses their children, those unborn at Sinai, now grown, and he reminds them of the just and righteous God that they serve and that their forefathers found out how just and righteous God can be. They found it out the hard way. Because, again, they neither trusted nor obeyed God. They complained constantly. They complained that it was not fair that they were brought out of the comfort of their captivity to die trapped along the waters. And God saves them now. It was not fair that they left all of that good food behind and now all they had to eat was bread. And God provided it was not fair that they were made to wander the desert for 40 years, not knowing what was going to happen, where they were going to go, and yet God was still there providing. 
They had done nothing to deserve being rescued, yet God did indeed rescue them. They had been in Egypt for over 400 years. And in that time, much of their culture and their beliefs had been corrupted. It was only when their situation started to get really hard that they finally cried out to God. And when he answered, they complained. They cried for deliverance. They, cry, they cried for rescue. They cried for justice. But only when things were not going their way. See, the Israelites did a terrible job of being faithful to God. Now, they were God's chosen people. and Perhaps they were crying out for what they deserved as his chosen people. But they forgot the key word there, though. Chosen. They were his people because he chose them. They did not deserve anything special. They were as sinful as any other people. And we know from, from what Scripture tells us, and we know from experience that in time, all get what they deserve, unless God intervenes. He has the power to save us from the death and destruction that we deserve, that we have earned. Our God has revealed that our faith saves. Our faith in Him is our God, our Heavenly Father. Our faith in Him through His Son, Jesus. And Jesus said that faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains and do miraculous things. We are called by faith. But then we read stories like this and pretty much everything throughout the, New, the Old Testament. And we wonder what chance do we have to be faithful? The Israelites saw Amazing miracles firsthand. They witnessed the incomparable power of God. They heard his voice in the shadow of his presence. They turned away from him. They did not remain faithful. Or more accurately, they did not have faith. Now there's times when we think about how we, we wish that we could see some unquestionable proof of God's power to help us to strengthen our faith. And we want to we wanna call back to those days of miracles. Well, when you look at the Bible, we, we, we often focus upon the miracles and we focus upon how great and awesome it would be to see these things and, and how that would be the thing that would strengthen us, that would catalyze our faith. And yet there are so many examples of those throughout history that witnessed those miracles firsthand that did not have faith. It did not catalyze their faith. So I warn you right now that seeing is not believing. To see does not produce faith. And the Israelites are a classic example of that. How many miracles did they witness and still there was no faith. To see does not produce faith, but by faith we do indeed see. It is by faith that we see the hand of God in the world around us. It is by faith that we recognize His presence in our lives. Now there may be times where I, I ask the question, how, what chance do we have to be faithful? Because there may be times that there are faith wavers from time to time a bit here and there. But that in itself does not condemn us. See, our faith is the foundation of our relationship with God. And as long as that small seed of faith remains, as long as we have that small seed of faith, mountains can be moved. And we know that the mountain that will get moved one day is the one that brings the sting of death. So we can hold fast to even the smallest faith and know that that brings us to God. And in His faithfulness, we are truly, undeservedly blessed. Not getting what is fair, but what is a great gift from our loving God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessing of our lives. Once again, we humble ourselves before you, knowing that 
to get what we truly deserve, what we earn on a daily basis in this world and in your sight is death and destruction. But you are a merciful, loving God. And you call to us by faith and those who come to you who answer that call, who have faith and maintain them, even the smallest, you tell us, even the smallest grain of faith that that small seed can do miraculous things. And we know by your power that that faith that brings us in relationship with you through your son Jesus, that that faith will stamp off death and that we will have life with you in your kingdom through your son Jesus. We thank you for these blessings. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.